We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello everyone, uh, on site and online to the session, to the workshop, the paradox of virus contact tracing apps. And let me just uh, quickly introduce you to the agenda of today's workshop. So firstly, we will start with the 10 minute introduction of uh, the thematic background and also of our speakers. Uh, then uh, the speakers uh, who are with us, and I will introduce you uh, soon who they are. Uh, they will share with uh, us their presentations. Then we will have an opportunity to, to listen to the panel discussion between the speakers. And after that, we'll start the interactive uh, part of the panel. And uh, we will divide into two breakup groups in which uh, we'll have some discussion. And then after that discussion, uh, there will be time for some remarks and summary. And that's basically the whole session. And with that, I would like to pass the floor to Jenna, who will introduce us to the background of this session. Jenna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. I hope that all of you will be able to hear me. So I am today's online moderator. I'm Jenna Fong from netmission.asia. So now I'm going to give a little bit of background. So I guess at the end, uh, at the beginning, of the pandemic, I come up with these ideas on um, on this topic because one years ago, we heavily depend on the contact tracing app uh, to handle to handle how we control to the spread of the um, the uh, virus before we have the vaccinations. So that's we come up with this interesting topic here. I guess. At the start of the century, the term track and trace was purely used in respect of our parcels only, but now it applies to humans too, I think. So to tackle with the situation and to live through the pandemic, we become more dependent on the use of the internet and technology. Whether a centralized or a more decentralized model is being adopted in one nation, such as technological method, is supposed to help address the pandemic more effectively and help us get back to living our normal life sooner. While naturally public health comes first, there is a growing concern of data privacy surveillance on citizens brought by the tracing app, which can never be neglected. While data is undoubtedly important in solving the problems of the pandemic, we must always be cautious about how much of our privacy we expose. So is it truly um, dichotomy that we must either sacrifice our privacy for uh, public health or put our public health at risk to preserve human rights? Or actually without such technology, would our economic activity and movement continues to be restricted? in itself, another form of human rights violation. What is the balance or will it always be a never ending paradox of control and freedom? So I guess today we have a few speakers to share us different views from uh, academia view or sharing some case study on how, how is the situations of the use of a contact app, virus contact tracing app in different different country, including the Latin America, Asia Pacific, um, and so and also our audience from different parts of the world. And I hope that we can exchange slightly a little bit idea on the practice. And hopefully by the end of this workshop, we can get to know uh, know more about different cases uh, in this world, so we can develop some new uh, conceptual framework or case study into policy making, uh, particularly in digital policy development community. So we can encourage a sustainable 
mechanism in governing data privacy and protection and issues like surveillance brought by uh, about by the use of technologies like this kind of apps these days because maybe perhaps we could see uh, we will even more dependent on technology so these are basically um, our background for this workshop and I guess I won't take too much time on giving it Instead, I would like to drop another link to our workshop details in the chat. And so those in the room and on Zoom can, can access to it and refer to it. And that will be helpful for, for our discussion later. Time back to yours, Amelia. Thank you very much, Jenna. Just uh, let me display the next slide. So as I mentioned before, now it's time to reveal the speakers uh, of our session. So today we have uh, with us Pratek Vagra, who is a research analyst uh, with the technology and policy program at the Takshas Hila Institution. Before Takshas Hila, he spent eight years working in consulting and product management roles at Akamai Technologies. Pratek's research interests include the impact of technology in democ democratic network societies, sorry, uh, internet shutdowns, information disorder, and major issues affecting the internet policy space in India. He has published editorials across publications like Deccan Herald, The Print, The Diplomat, and others. Pratek also writes a newsletter on information disorder from an Indian perspective, Miss This Mal Information. So Pratik is with us online today. Also with us, we have uh, another speaker, uh, Yanaina Costa. Uh, she is senior researcher at Institute for Technology and Society. Uh, she has degree in social and economic development, uh, Paris, uh, Pante Paris the first Pantheon Sorbonne. Uh, she is postgraduate, of course, in digital law, and uh, her fields of interest uh, are public policies, technology, and human rights. And the third speaker at our session is Elliot Mann. Uh, he is a recent graduate of Swinburne Law School in Melbourne, Australia, where he majored in law and cybersecurity has been involved both uh, in the government and the private sector in developing cybersecurity projects and legal, uh, legal technology applications. He is keen on leveraging his experience in major law and consulting firms to build greater awareness of internet issues. Elliot has been involved in internet governance through the ICANN Next Gen Generation Program, the ISOC IGF Youth Ambassador, uh, and regional initiatives. So uh, these are our speakers uh, for today's event. And with that, uh, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, uh, Pratek. I'm very sorry if I am uh, reading oh. it in the wrong way. <laughs> Pratek it's Bagra. It's fine, thank you. I'm, I'm just going to quickly share some slides. I think you'll have to... Uh, stop sharing yours. Well, let me see if I can. Okay, great. Uh, can you can you see my slides? Yes, we can. All right, great. So, uh, so, so Jen has already given us uh, a good amount of background, right? But I just wanted to start with this visualization uh, from this paper. I've linked to it below, which was published in Internet Policy Review earlier this year. Uh, and it just gives you the landscape of you know what different uh, how the COVID nineteen response apps were across the world in different countries. Right? And it gives you a sense of the number of different types of uh, approaches and things uh, that we saw. Right now, I have just about seven to eight minutes. So I just want to cover three broad points, uh, and I'm going to keep it wider. Then we can you know go go deep dive as the as the discussion carries on. But I want to focus on three things. Right, the idea of uh, uh, technology theater. Uh, the a framework called the viability rating framework that uh, my colleagues at Takshila Institution and I uh, tried to develop early on uh, in, in May last year. 
uh, and there's some general considerations uh, in, in, in this scenario. Right. Uh, so let me start. Right. So what what is technology theater? So this idea was, uh, you know, so there was this essay by Sean McDonald in in, in CIGI sometime last year, uh, and he proposed this idea of uh, a technology theater, right? Which is essentially when your public policy response is more focused on the details of the technology uh, rather than addressing the actual problem or the core uh, or, or the core issue. Uh, now this is not this is not unique to COVID. This has happened before, and it will happen. It will continue happening, right? Uh, but it's important to look at what the implications of uh, something like this are. Uh, and when this happens, uh, you know, so, but it, the outcome is that two, you know, the two two broad things to look at first is that one technology plays a much larger role in the way citizens and you know and people interact with the government. Uh, and second, it also then plays a very a, 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 an outsized role in how the government and states respond to problems and how they solve them, right? Uh, and as a result of that, uh, what then happens is that uh, we have a situation where there is, uh, you know, essentially a shift in shift in uh, shift in power. And what happens is that uh, issues that had to be you know addressed through uh, public consultation, etc., now get moved towards. Uh, procurement processes and rules, right? That are that are out that are out, and the decisions on these are outside of the uh, of the public domain. Uh, in many cases, uh, you know, nuanced conversations about how the technology works, how you know how to go about instrumenting them, etc. Uh, all of that then becomes uh, becomes sensationalized, right? Uh, and then it has three broad downstream effects that we can think of. Uh, first is obviously the opportunity cost because we're diverting resources, right? As 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 the first thing said, uh, you're diverting resources to focusing on the technology rather than uh, sometimes rather than the, at the expense of the core problem, right? In certain situations, uh, the lens of analysis that we apply to these policies changes because we're not necessarily looking at uh, the outcome of, of the policy, but you're looking at the you know the technology or the technical process, right? So, uh, in in one way to think about it in public policy terms is that. Uh, you know, efficiency is being given a much higher uh, weightage than effectiveness. When in reality, you need to find a balance uh, between. Right? Uh, and the third is uh, an outsized role of experts. And this is not to say that experts don't have a role to play; they have a very important role to play. Uh, but I, I believe the point that uh, that Sean McDonald was making that is that they have an outsized role uh, to play, and that sometimes also uh, coincides with the fact that often certain experts also have uh, interests uh, at stake. Right. Uh, now, just very quickly, I want to switch now to the framework called uh, the, you know, the viability framework that, uh, that that we had tried to define last year. And the idea of this was was really to say that okay, we have a number of uh, these interventions being tried. Is there a way for us to assess what kind of impact uh, they can have? Because our end goal was to ensure that they complement pandemic management and not really uh, take attention from or draw attention away from, from pandemic management, right? So we, so we looked at uh, three criteria. Uh, one was the population penetration, which is in terms of what percentage of the population, you know, a certain technology could benefit or could affect, right? Uh, second was privacy, uh, right? Uh, I don't necessarily need to explain that. I think that that's self-explanatory. Uh, and the third was effectiveness, whether it can, uh, you know, achieve its result or in terms of technology, uh, how, how, you know, what is the efficacy of it? Right, uh, and the way we went about doing that. So one way to look at population penetration is some sort of proxy for equity. Uh, but I want to call out that there are a lot other considerations uh, that 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 need to go into you know whether it is absolutely equitable. Uh, but you know, sitting in May 2020, this was I, I think a, a reasonable proxy that that we could we could come to, and we tried to rate them on the basis of you know essentially high, medium, low. We use the color color coding scheme. But it was it was high it essentially high medium low right uh, on privacy we looked at uh, certain things we looked at whether there was uh, purpose limitation defined what type of permissions uh, the various apps tried to look at uh, whether there was you know whether they, they de-anonymized data what sort of data retention policies they had uh, and what sort of oversight uh, mechanisms were built in now again we we had done this as a forward looking exercise but you know if if you want to extend this framework. Uh, further, you can also look at addressing some of this stuff through through privacy audits down the road, and then you know essentially tweak the criteria uh, that that we look at. Uh, and the last was uh, was effectiveness, right? Which is uh, like I said, the efficacy of of the technology. Now, again, at the time we were doing this, you know, to, I think right now everyone thinks of contact tracing and Bluetooth low energy. Uh, 
uh, and essentially Apple and Google's uh, exposure notification system. Uh, but you know, May, May last year there were a lot of experiments uh, being conducted. We were looking at uh, you know, th th so there were about I think over sixty different applications in in India alone, uh, and you know, trying different uh, di different levels of things. Some were looking at GPS, etc. Right. So we also tried to uh, determine that. Uh, now, just to to wrap up, because I know I'm also running on, on time, certain considerations that, that became obvious to us as we were doing this was, uh, you know, in a situation like this, right, how do we balance for uh, equity, which we need to do versus, you know, uh, versus speed, right, that, that you have to have in, uh, in, in a pandemic response. Uh, where will this framework come and help us guide whether something needs to be voluntary or mandated, right? Now, obviously, if it's not addressing a large number of large portion of your population, you may want to stay away from mandatory kind of measures and you want to keep things as, uh, as voluntary as possible. Uh, whether the response should be at a uh, union government level, right? Or a federal level uh, versus different state level states uh, doing it on their own. Uh, what role do algorithms uh, play in terms of determination of uh, risk and immunity? Uh, and, you know, again, this was, the, the platform power was not really apparent back in May when we had devised this framework, uh, but really the you know uh, we've seen over the course of the last year how a lot of decisions and a lot of countries' uh, responses were shaped by the decision that Apple and Google uh, took for their uh, with their exposure notification uh, yeah, framework, right? Uh, and just very quickly to to close, uh, I, I want to you know highlight some points from uh, a document by the Ada Lovelace Institute, uh, which is. Uh, a few points that is that essentially when we're looking at these scenarios, the tech needs to be uh, effective, right? Uh, public monitoring, public health monitoring is, is high stakes. So we need to justify uh, the measures that we take. Uh, corner cases, edge cases, errors, you know, looking at looking at errors needs to be built in proactively rather than dealing with them uh, down the road, uh, right? And, you know, all your intervention ultimately will be we'll judge them as part of this as part of a system and not in isolation which is to say that you can have an app that you know scales to millions of users but if you don't have the public health system to go along with it uh, it may not be it may not be as uh, as effective right uh, so with that i am i think i'm done on time i will stop sharing Thank you very much. So uh, now uh, I would like to give the floor to our second speaker, Elliot Mann. The floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, I don't have any slides um, and, and I think I'm gonna focus on really the situation here in Australia because it's quite interesting how um, the contact tracing apps and everything have developed. So there's really two phases to how contact tracing apps have developed in Australia. So first of all, um, nationally last year, around the start of last year, the government commissioned a government government digital agency to develop a proximity tracing app um, based off uh, the Trace Together app in Singapore. So we had the COVID Safe app was the first one developed in Australia and that came out um, in the middle of last year. And um, it was, you know, Bluetooth tracing app um, keep it on the entire time. You know, there were issues initially about how good it was, but, but basically it was a Bluetooth tracing app. And they actually passed amendments to our privacy laws here in Australia um, federally to make sure that the information there was, um, you know, uh, stored, stored safely. You could only, you could not be forced to use the app. It was illegal to have government agencies or private entities force you to use the contact tracing app as a condition of entry to places. Um, and the government was quite concerned with the privacy implications. There was a big um, concern about that in the community. So they made public their privacy impact assessments and they made public the source code. Now, that was fantastic, except for by the middle of last year, COVID wasn't necessarily a problem in Australia anymore. And and actually, um, the cases never got high enough such that the, um, the contact tracing through the app, through the proximity tracing in the app, was actually needed. Um, all throughout last year, every single case in Australia was able to be manually um, contact traced by an individual. So there was no need to use the app starter. Um, fast forward to this year, and of course, 
um, with the rise of Delta and everything, um, we've had even more cases in Australia, such that not all the cases are being um, contact traced manually. Now, you would think that this is where the um, app would now come into play, everyone using it, but of course, everyone's gotten it by now. And we have what's the second phase of contact tracing apps in Australia, which is the QR code tracing apps. And so this is interesting because in Australia, being a federal system, you have the federal government and the states and territories. And the COVID safe app, the proximity tracing one is a federal one, but it all, of course has privacy protections and everything. Each state and territory around the end of last year also rolled out contact tracing apps based on scanning QR codes. And I think we'd all be familiar with the idea of when you enter a venue, scanning a QR code and saying you've been marked there. And again, the way these work is that you scan your QR code and um, if it turns out you've been at the venue at the same time as a COVID case, uh, you will be pinged, as it were, um, within the next few days and you have to go get tested. Um, it's happened to me at least twice and it's happened to most people I know at least a few times. Um, and it's very, I mean, it's understandably frustrating having to go get tested. But again, uh, you know, that's how the QR code tracing app works. And the issue is, of course, is that while when the federal app came out, there were all these legislated privacy um, protections, there's, none, there's nothing like that for the uh, state-based ones. In fact, there have been cases in Australia um, of police accessing the QR code data, people's checking data um, for police investigations, which would be impossible under the other app, but definitely available under these ones. So uh, we're in this weird situation where the app that has the best protections and you know uses the proximity tracking, uh, nobody uses and has not been proven to work. Whereas the apps that do work have no privacy protections at all um, and are being accessed by other entities. And um, we're seeing some changes towards that. In Victoria, where I am, they've recently legislated a new pandemic law. Um, and as part of that, they've added privacy protections for the QR code data. But um, in the rest of the country, it's still quite unclear. So this is that's the main concern that I have at the moment is that um, people look back and they go, oh, we got all these great protections, but unfortunately it was for an app that didn't work and nobody uses and the apps that do work now and that uh, people are using all the time and by law you have to use, um, have no privacy protections at all. So it's a really interesting situation we find ourselves in. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Elliot. And uh, as our first speaker, uh, we have here today with us, uh, Janaina, Janaina Costa. Thank you so much. I have some slides to share just so, so I, I don't miss myself uh, in the speaker. Uh, Jenna, you, you're going to share them for us? Sure, give me a second. Okay, great. So, uh, and thank you everyone here. Uh, my name is Janaina Costa and thank you so much, Jenna, to organizing this panel and this workshop. And I, I hope I have, I bring some uh, more questions than answers <laughs> to our discussion. So what I wanted to, uh, to share with you and you can share the next slide, Jenna, please, is that uh, here in Brazil, we didn't have uh, like the federal government, uh, kind of gave up uh, using contact tracing applications precisely because of the controversies that surround it, in addition to a lack of uh, coordination between federal and state initiatives. So instead, uh, we use more heat maps uh, generated from cross data from telephone operators, which in theory use anonymous data on the location of mobile cell set device to measure social uh, isolation rates. Uh, just a second. I, I I think everyone just see the, the first slide. I think you can go to the second or third now, Jenna, if you can. Thank you. Is it not moving? Not for me, for the, for the other okay. slides. Um, no, it's not. No, not for me either. Wait, let me just come back then by doing this way. Is it moving? Yeah, it's working now. 
All right, I'll just show it this way then. Great, thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, so I'm just gonna sh show you some of examples that what you use here in America Latina, as I told you, not in Brazil because you, you gave up on that for um, heat maps, but we had, uh, um, and I'm gonna share in a few minutes with you, used uh, a rule of law and a right-based test and a risk-based test uh, to evaluate uh, three uh, contact tracing apps throughout America Latina. So we actually applied a test framework that was developed uh, to understand the governance of digital identity system to these applications. So this framework was developed by the Center of Internet and Society in India, the CIS, and the test identifies the case studies, in this case studies, the characteristics, the use that has been applied to other cases of digital identity in the regions, and but also in other teams such as contract tracing and context. Um, mainly, like COVID, COVID radar well, in the Mexican state of Nuevo Leon, we had also Peru and Tus Manos uh, in Peru, and we also had the Corona app in Colombia. Three of the three of them uh, were not mandatory and actually ended more being used as a means to, of informing the population than as effective applications for the virus contact tracing because of they are not mandatory. But even though what we, we had as a test summary and lessons was that broadly speaking, none of them uh, performed well or have a limited performance in all the three tests, the law test, uh, the rule of law test, the rights based test and the risk based test. So most of these apps operate without a specific legislation mandate. Uh, could not find any codified law or executive ordinance uh, validating it. So nevertheless, the use of personal data uh, was broadly protected by the general data protection legislating when it could be found in the country. Uh, some of these apps also have some provision of rights-based principles, such as data minimization, specific specifications on access to data and mitigation mechanisms. And we also evaluate the terms of use né, that address data minimization and detail those secret practice. However, there was no provision for destruction or anonymization of data when the limit period was over, or therefore there was not providing mechanisms for when and how to access the data will be interrupted. This was um, a concern throughout the, the three evaluations of these three uh, applications. Uh, I think you can, can go, continue please. Yes, so uh, once uh, uh, we pass that, I'm gonna share with you soon the, the links for the, the whole evaluation and the, and while you can see the framework that we test. But I would like to share with you how it was done in Brazil. So this is a picture of the heat maps that were created. They, they took aggregated data that usually do not identify people who are uh, in, uh, in some area, but only the presence of connected cell phones in this area. So you can create a heat map to indicate places of concentration and can give like a, a more or less comprehensive view of uh, displacement partners, if people are living through the quarantine of their breaking quarantine. But however, there's still uh, some doubts about uh, how this data is treated and whether they can go from a macro view to the granular view of each individual connected. So here I, we get this crossword here, how to create and analyze a database that really can strike a balance between usefulness for, for those who use it, and at the same time, that not go around revealing everyone's identity, and how then, how can we know if the data has been really anonymized? And, and for Brazil, we have to stress that anonymized and anonymous data are different terms vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the Brazilian data protection legislation. So in Brazil, one speaks of anonymized data and not anonymous data to give uh, this idea of process that this data has once been a personal data, but it went through a procedure so that the links with its owners were completely erased, make it anonymized. So our general data protection law states that 
this anonymized data is will not be considered personal data for the purpose of the law, except that when the anonymization process to which you're submitted is reversed using exclusively their own means or when with reasonable efforts and pay attention to reasonable efforts. So in another words, what you have here is that for the data to be considered anonymized, we need to look at least two factors, one uh, objective and another one subjective. So as an objective factor in the concept of reasonable efforts, the law itself uh, mentions uh, the cost and time needed to reverse the anonymization process according to the available technologies. So on the other hand, for the subjective factors, we have to look uh, at who carry out the anonymization process and for whom is trying to break it. So all of these it counts when you measure whether the data has been anonymized for real or not, or is it just a pseudo anonymization and you can reverse back to, to the data owner. So making a uh, personal data again. So or rather the company just hides some information here and there that really allows anyone with a little more time in their hands, né? Uh, time in their life to access and review the identity of the data holders. It can pass again, Jenna, thank you. So this one thing that you have in Brazil was a, a notorious case to illustrate how this data sometimes are, are being said anonymized, but can be easily reversed uh, without uh, not such a reasonable effort. So it can be easy traced back to identifying the holders was a notary case in which was uh, possible to review the identity of people who had their data anonymized in a database available to many third parties in the internet, completely public, uh, for the by the largest Brazilian cell phone operator. So this, they shared this database, uh, saying that it was anonymized, just generate information, but just. Uh, using a uh, journalist, using just references to social media and other websites, she could identify many, many uh, of the, the subjects that were displayed in this database. So this was a hidden scandal and proves how much this uh, process of anonymized should be better framework and better looked at. Uh, so, uh, just to wrap it up, my, my presentation here, and I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have, and you can put in the chat, and I will address them in the chat also. It's that uh, in Brazil, it's not uh, uh, it's legal, so data it's legal to process the data in order for the protection of life or physical safety of the holder or a third part, and for the protection of health, and as in other countries. But the public administration can also make use of this processing and share the use of data to execution of public policies and for the combat of pandemics. However, what I want to stress, and it's worth really worth mentioning before I wrap up the presentation, it's that uh, this approval given by the LGPD to use uh, personal data, even without the consent of their holders in order to protect uh, public health uh, the health of third parties. It's not a, a, a blank check, so it's not unrestricted. So the data process for the generation of public policies or to fight the pandemic should only be used for this specific purpose. And if they are used for other purposes, such as selling advertising or sending electoral messages afterwards, this use is completely illegal and could be lead to an accountability of those involved under the data Brazilian data protection law. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm going to share here with you in the chat these studies of the framework from Mexico, Peru, and Colombia. I think you'll find very interesting too. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Janaina. Uh, just let me uh, share the presentation again. And I'm oh, sorry, it's not moving. And it's moving. Okay, so with that, let me introduce you to the next part of today's workshop, which is uh, the panel discussion, because all uh, our free speakers made some uh, pretty interesting remarks. So I would, I would just like to ask you, 
our speakers if you would like to comment on each other presentations. If any of you would like to start, just please take the floor. Okay, maybe just to facilitate. Uh, so I, I can go yes. very quickly. Mm -hmm. I think uh, sure. so. Uh, so I just want to, you know, the, the point that uh, uh, that Elliot made, right, about uh, application, you know, the two sets of applications, right? The one that there were all sorts of uh, privacy protections for turned out that it, you know, it, it wasn't used much uh, while the, the one, it turns out, you know, with with QR code scanning, etc. It turned out that there aren't a lot of privacy protections for, and that's the one that's being extensively used now. Uh, I think that is an extremely uh, interesting thing, right? And, and I depending on how uh, that use case spreads, I think that's something that that uh, we need to be to, to be to be watchful for right because uh, you know it, it the, the way these interventions come about they they're, they're always shifting so it's important uh, you know to to keep an eye across uh, across all things right? and I think that that that's an important uh, important part. I would also to make a provocation to my fellows uh, in, in, the, in the panel speakers. It's like, a, uh, as Elliot was mentioning, it was a law in Australia, so say that forbidden to make an app uh, mandatory, but we also know when the app's not mandatory, we don't have uh, full adoption. And uh, I think under 60% of adoption, uh, these contact tracing apps are nearly un, uh, served for nothing. So how, how is the, the situation in India, for example, how is the balance between is mandatory and how is the balance between privacy and public health, uh, Patrick? Yeah, so it, it it was a very so you know uh, as as things stand right now uh, there isn't a, you know the contact tracing application that are not really in the public conversation uh, right now, uh, but going back to you know the the, the middle of last year. Uh, it it was certainly being discussed, right? And and as part of the paper that, uh, that 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 I've shared a link to, we also tried to you know just try to estimate. Uh, look, because this relied on Bluetooth, it relied on you know ev everyone having smartphone, right? Uh, and and a certain certain capability, certain type of smartphone, you know, because again the the market here is uh, is very spread across, right? You have low, you have a lot of lo low end phones, you have mid you have mid range phones, and then you have a few high end phones. Uh, so from that perspective and based on you know what public estimates there were uh, th there was you know it, it 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 would turn out that a lot of people would not really be uh, you know would not really benefit they would not be able to use the the a, a smartphone application uh, anyway uh, but the way the way mobile connectivity was was disp was dispersed uh, maybe there was, you know, there was some potential for it to be used in cities versus uh, other parts of the country. Uh, but again, you know, it, it, even within cities, I think it's 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 quite a big leap to say that everyone has a smartphone, and everyone will be able to use it. Uh, and we, which is what so we were, you know, we were advocating for you know, this not to be mandatory in in in, in any shape or form, right? Uh, e even though you know, so that you had cases like. Uh, so, uh, you know, a, a fellow organization in India called the Internet Democracy Project was actually maintaining a tracker of different, uh, of, of different, you know, either private companies or different state departments who, who actually then went out and made the contact tracing app, uh, app mandatory, right? And th there was, there was pushback from civil society uh, wherever possible. So it, it, you know, it, it, here it was that, that situation where, you know, th there just weren't a lot of, uh, you know, uh, it's hard to say how many uh, smartphones would have been able to benefit from it. And of course, you know, as it turned out through the pandemic, uh, the way it spread, it, you know, Bluetooth low energy was really not, not that reliable an indicator anyway. Uh, but, and that, that's why, if, you know, if from the, from the start, we were advocating that it should not be, it should not be made mandatory, right? It shouldn't be a way to deny people access or rights uh, in, in any shape or form. I totally agree with you, Patrick. And I think the conversation is shifting from uh, contract acing apps now for the COVID passports. All yeah. the, the same questions should be mandatory, okay? But if it's not mandatory, it's usually it's worthless. And back again, public health uh, 
uh, privacy on the balance all, all together all over again. That's I'm feeling we see this story to repeat itself uh, so quickly, you know. I, I agree. And, and I think one of the interesting things, um, interesting concepts that's kind of come out of my research um, is that uh, in Australia, so what the, the federal COVID safe app might have failed because the privacy law the protections around that were too strong um, because the health and the contact tracing is being done at a state level. And to get the data from the federal contact tracing app, you had to give it to the states and the privacy protections and the processes around that were so strict that it was actually very difficult to hand that data over. So I was wondering, Janina, maybe your thoughts on whether you can go too far in the other direction and you can make the privacy laws too strong and, and kind of defeat the purpose from that end. Uh, it's, I, I think it would be very hard, uh, uh, those words to come out of my mouth, uh, like privacy law being too hard. Uh, I, I'm really a, a privacy person on, on that matter, but I understand your point. Uh, and yes, I, I think uh, we, we have, we have to have a balance there, for, for, for sure, for sure. It's a very good point. And, and you know, I, I, while, while I agree with that, I'd say that I think we're, we're a little, at, at least, you know, we're a little far away from privacy apps maybe going too far, uh, especially, especially where I live. We're arguing for a stronger uh, stronger law uh, as compared to the draft that, that we're seeing right now. But, you know, I, 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 that, that, but that concern resonates, right? It, it is very easy for the pendulum to, to shift the other way, but I, I think we're, we're not there yet. No, and, and I think I would, I would say that this is certainly a, a not normal case. And, and, I, and I think the approach um, where I am in Victoria of, of carving out and creating specific sort of roles and processes around that, around in the privacy law, to, to recognize that is, this is a special situation, I think is a decent approach to take. But I think that's recognized, like I, I was stating like for the Brazilian General Data Protection Law. So we have specifically uh, and highlighted uh, uh, use case that you can share and use uh, and treat uh, personal data even without uh, the holder's consent, if it's for the, the for public health uh, purpose like fighting a pandemic or even to just for third party health situation. But the important here is have a clear lines what that means and no go further. Uh, for example, for Colombia, because they don't have a general data protection law, it's very blurred the lines, how far you can go, how, what you can do with this data, what is gonna be done after the emergency situation is gone. And that's a real concern. Okay, this data will be deleted, you'll be anonymized or something like that. At least this kind of pre uh, basic standards should be very clear. Okay, we're gonna use this spe special situation, but once the emergency is gone, we're gonna raise all this data because we only use for this specific purpose. I think that's a very important point. Maybe our audience have some views on that that you would like to share with us, maybe on site or in the chat. I believe earlier when Elliot was doing some sharing, Alan was typing something in the chat. It was quite earlier. But I guess we will we will have the breakout group very soon also. But I will I will look to Amelia in terms of the time, whether we are moving to the breakout group soon. Because I, I guess after the breakout group, we'll definitely have a round table and we'll discuss it with everyone. Yes, uh, I guess if uh, all our speakers are fine with that, we will move to the breakout rooms part. So if uh, Jenna, you could uh, introduce our attendees uh, in the format yeah. of breakout rooms. Sure. Will you be able to move it to the next slide slightly a little bit about the breakout group? Yeah. 
but probably we have some new arrangement because um, I guess for now, uh, people in room in Katowice will be grouping in one group and joining Amelia and Petro uh, together and discussing some policy questions. I will drop it in the chat later on. And at the same time, Amelia will continue to square, uh, share the policy question on the screen so you can see it in the room. And for those who are online joining us to Zoom, you will be split into two virtual group. One will be joining Amelia and the other onsite participant. And the rest will stay in group two with me and also Bea Guevara from the Philippines. And then we will continue uh, the discussion on the policy questions and on, you know, echoing on the sharing from our guest speaker. So that's basically it. And after the breakout group discussion, we would like our participant to do a, like a really brief and concise summary in the round table so we can further discuss it um, later on when we all back into the main room. And yeah, we try to get more attendees more involved instead of just having our speaker talking most of the time in this one and a half hour session. So I wonder if anyone in the room or in the Zoom room have any questions um, uh, regarding breakout group discussion. Oh, and so sorry, I missed it, Bea's comment in the chat. And in case not all of us in the room are also on the Zoom, I would like to read it out also. So Bea mentioned, here in the Philippines, the app is not mandatory, but similar to Hong Kong, the app is starting to become more uh, used. But some establishment let people entering write in a paper logbook, since some people do have smartphone but no internet connections or mobile data to be able to access the QR code of the app. So I guess Bear was also echoing some comments I made regarding situation in Hong Kong. And Bea also point out the problem of people with no internet access in terms of um, whatever reasons. And I guess some people from the older generations also have problem using the app also. So I guess that also adds to a point where we can explore when we have the breakout group discussion, yeah? So if everyone is ready, I guess we'll break into the room. Uh, technical support on Zoom, please help us open the breakout room. And I hope everyone, everyone can move it smoothly in, in, in the room in terms of um, the discussion for group number one. And also Emilia, please help uh, scroll it to the next slide so everyone can see the policy question in, in your room. And I will copy these questions in the chat so everyone can, uh, can refer to it. And technical support definitely needs some more time to handle the breakout room on Zoom. So I guess if those in Katowice can start moving a little bit to get it closer so, so we can start the discussion soon. And of course, I, I think I just forgot to mention our speaker will be joining the group of definitely. So uh, Pratik will be joining group number one and Janelle and Elliot will be in group two also. And the rest on Zoom room will be randomly assigned, but I'm not sure if you will be able to jump between two rooms. Let me check. Yes, everyone will be in the room can be in one group or or if we have a big group of participants there at the moment because what I have learned was that it's a good size of having one group for discussion earlier Just a few comments on the policy questions. These questions are meant to address those uh, thematic focus designed for uh, IGF 2021. 
So I guess that's how we can spend this 20 minute in terms of um, relating it back to the main theme of this year's IGF. So we can contribute our examples and cases to these questions. And so we can contribute to the output of IGF 2021 later on in our report. So I think we can start with the first question now. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many folks are around uh, to participate, but uh, yeah, it, it, it will be good to hear some views on, on what, what the participants think right? uh, in terms of uh, responsibilities of uh, government, businesses, uh, technical community, civil society, uh, and researchers. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so you know, please feel free to unmute yourself, right? You don't have to raise your hands. It, it's, a, it's an open discussion. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Pew from Myanmar. I would like to um, share my point of view regarding the first question. The first thing is like, uh, is that they have the, not only the government, but also the businesses have uh, need to have the transparency on they are, they are uh, on the data and the privacy uh, once they develop the app, uh, such as the content tracing as or something like that. And also regarding the digital inclusion and respecting for the human rights, um, I, I believe that in a country, the government has the main responsibility to respect for the human rights. Uh, currently uh, in uh, the, the there is no, uh, uh, that the human rights violation are happening, uh, not only in the digital space, but also in the um, uh, offline space. That's why I'm, I think uh, the main responsibility of the government is uh, uh, to respect, to having the transparency on, 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 on uh, the, on, uh, on their, um, uh, how, how can I say, uh, on their, um, well, in in every uh everywhere of uh the the government and also they have to uh, always have to consider to respect the human human right uh, especially in developing the policies or law for 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 the public yeah that's my point of view uh, thank you thank um, you for <laughs> hi i would hi, like me. to say uh, another thing in terms of like businesses in regard to uh, or respect for human rights is that I think it's really important that businesses should not put profit over people and especially in those times where data can be abused I feel like someone needs to um, check on these companies I feel like a big example for this would be Facebook I'm not sure if you heard about the Facebook files but what happened there but I feel like it's really important that um uh, as I said, like to uh, put human rights uh, up front and not just look what makes profit. And that's just my take on <laughs> businesses. And I feel like the government should be checking these businesses because I feel like we had this, they were really separated. We had government and businesses and they were, they were always like, oh, it's a private company. We can't do anything. I feel like we need to like put more responsibility on the government to keep an eye out for these businesses. So that's my point of view. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If I could just uh, jump in with a quick comment, uh, if you would like to ask something or uh, add a comment, just please uh, raise your hand before, uh, because we just want to, you know, give equal chances to people on site and online to, and also commenting on chat to uh, have their time. So just please uh, raise, use the raise your hand button. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I think I gave the wrong instruction, Amelia. Okay, uh, does anyone else want to add to the first question or should we? Uh, should we take up the second one? Uh, there is a comment about 
uh, from Lenin Sages in the chat. So I will just read it uh, to everyone in the audience. Hi, everyone. I have a suggestion for question one. It could be uh, to establish stakeholder boards with other sectors to regulate about the changes on legislation, leg, legislation, legislation related to COVID-19 and other potential epidemics. Also using this system of checks and balance to ensure uh, 10 human rights are respected, not just the rights to live, but also securing privacy. Sorry, I can't speak right now. She commented there. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. And do we have any comments uh, from the audience also on site? Okay, so uh, yes, I think we can move to the second question. Okay, uh, so the second question is about how we can make use of uh, digital technologies to promote more equitable and peaceful societies. Uh, that are inclusive, resilient, and, and sustainable. And anyone want, want to comment on that? Yeah, yes, Pio again. Hello. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think uh, all stakeholders work together for the equitable and peaceful society for, for example, like for policy making process in the countries, not only in the country, they have to uh, get involved in the regional uh, uh, policy make uh, policy forums or policy discussion as well um, for, for the sustainability. And also the uh, civil society said that have to promote the Train capacity building program, training programs, uh, which can uh, have the disability to assess the digital technology uh, as well. Moreover, um, the different stakeholders uh, have uh, have to the negotiate uh, or negotiate uh, for for doing something related to the technology. For example, like if if the the uh, the government have to develop the uh, digital policy, uh, uh, which can uh, which which has the purpose to uh, innovate the digital policy in a country, they have to collaborate with the other stakeholder, and they have to uh, they should have to invite the uh, civil society sector, private sector, and other relevant stakeholder of uh, to to uh, uh, through the or public call or public uh, policy discussion, and then uh, they have to. Uh, and consider how to uh, they have to uh, put the all stakeholder idea for uh, for being the inclusive and uh, after the pandemic and also for resilience uh, that the government policy uh, really does matter for a country and also the import from the uh, civil society sector is also uh, mean a lot to the government uh, for developing the policy so by working uh, uh, in in short, uh, by working together, the different stakeholders and uh, being transparency, being accountability, and being res uh, responsibility for for the every 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 policy that that they lay down or uh, that the government uh, are trying uh, implementing uh, can boost uh, to to be more equitable uh, and peaceful society that are inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. That's, that's my point of view. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, because of the technical issues, uh, we are only left with five minutes. So uh, let's just move to the third question. And uh, Pratek, if you would like to start. Sure. Okay. So the third question is about how we can make sure that uh, digital technologies are not developed and used for harmful purposes, right? I think uh, this is uh, this is a great question, and probably just build on what uh, uh, what 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 Fire just said, right? That uh, you know, uh, I think this is this is Kranzberg's first law that technology is 
neither good nor bad nor is it neutral right uh, so uh, the the way to go about uh, you know mitigating mitigating harms is to ensure that uh, when we're deploying them uh, you know it, it is a consultative process we are involving uh, everyone especially those who can be affected the most right? especially the the vulnerable sections of uh, of population that are like that are always at the receiving end right of of any of any harmful effects first uh, so you know from my from my perspective i think it's uh, you know th- there's there's no single easy answer to this uh, it is uh, a you know a, a difficult problem that we need to work you know we need to work together we need to build out uh, you know make sure our processes a public you know a, a processes for public participation are, are resilient in this way can in, you know can incorporate a number of people number of views uh, take them on board and and, and then move on right uh, yeah there, there's no there's no ma- magic answer there's no easy answer to this uh, we need to do the hard work and uh, that's 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 my perspective uh, i i'm happy to hear others Okay, do we have any comments? I also think it is a very interesting question. So I would love to hear your remarks. I think somebody wrote on the chat. Is uh, Francis, are you in our breakout room? Yes, you are in ours. So I saw that you commented on the chat. Maybe you would like to uh, elaborate on it a little bit more. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And also, so I saw the comment, uh, their comment in the main room. And she mentioned that in the Philippines, we, in the context of contact tracing, we do have contact tracing apps. However, since there's no internet in many of the establishments, what we do here is we do manual logging in pen and paper. So what, what you should, what, what in, in recent days, there's have been issues on phishing, using the con, uh, phishing and smishing. So what, what you put on the manual log is the, your, your name and your contact number. And then some issues that are currently surfacing is that many hackers or scammers are using this contact number to do uh, some some bad deeds to the users so i'd like to echo what that Patrick uh mentioned that it, it's a long way to go uh i feel that uh, governments need to work with uh, the businesses uh, the technical actors in order to address this uh, different issues the new digital technologies thank you uh thanks antasia uh, i think that that's an interesting point yeah thank you very much francis and i don't know how much time we have left i think like 2 minutes so Maybe if we could have a quick comment from you, Pratik, or from somebody else from the participants on the fourth, uh, fourth question. Yeah, I think uh, values and norms is an interesting one, and, and I'd, on, I'd like to hear from the participants before, before I go. Uh, it's pure idea to reflect uh, uh, the first and second question of uh, the my answer of the first and second question. Um, the values are uh, regarding the values are on uh, um, every guidance have should have the transparency. That is a uh, one of the non uh, whatever we develop the policy whatever uh, whatever we. Uh, to the thing for the community. So that is a, one of the main, uh, uh, one of the norms that we have to think about. 
uh, think about it. And another thing is responsibility and accountability, uh, because if because uh, it is uh, sound like a very um, responsibility is one of the thing that the whatever the project thinks or whatever the government and uh, implements the projects uh, and implement uh, trying to lay down the policy. They have uh, they have to. Uh, take the uh, uh, they have to take the responsible and accountable for 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 the consequences of the uh, that policy for uh, for modifying or for uh, amend amending uh, the that policy for uh, to be better. Uh, so find find uh, I think uh, that is a main uh, values. Uh, that that's my opinion on the norms of norms to the laws the technology uh, and to enable the technology. Thank you. So I, I'll just add very quickly. I think I think yeah, I agree with uh, what, what Fire just said. I'll, I'll just add that I think you know we also need to bring in uh, inclusivity. We need to make you know we need you know we, we shouldn't be forcing these things on non people by making it mandatory. We need to win their uh, win their trust in, in, in the process. And I think it, it, it's easier said than done. Uh, but I think uh, that's that, that's the way forward uh, if we want to avoid the type of uh, politicization that we've seen right of of, uh, of especially the pandemic over the last uh, of the last two years uh, yeah we, we need to figure out a way how to you know how, how to make things voluntary make make people trust uh, the system and and then bring them along okay thank you very much for all your comments uh, i think that we are having less than one minute to go so thank you very much for this discussion and let's see you again uh, in the main room. Online participants are back into the main room. Just for those in the room <laughs> to know that we are back here. On-site participants are already in the room. <laughs> so <laughs> nice. All here. Okay, so I guess we are back to the, um, the part about round table now, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, I don't know if your uh, breakout room would like to start uh, to just quickly summarize the discussion you had. Sure. Um, Bea, would you like to summarize the, you know, the last part that you mentioned? Then I can briefly add to those points that you missed out at the beginning. Okay, sure. So uh, we actually started uh, backwards with uh, our policy questions, but I could start on the first question. Uh, what are or should be the responsibilities of the different sectors that are involved? And again, what is needed for them to fulfill the, the, these in an efficient and effective manner? Um, I did mention that uh, raising awareness or raising public awareness is necessary uh, in order for concerns and themes such as uh, what we're speaking on as digital inclusion and human rights uh, to be heard. Uh, I also did mention that I feel like it's very common to mention this in all the different issues that we talk about. But again, uh, raising awareness and sharing issues like this uh, to the public will always be part of the uh, baby steps and in order to reach our goals that we want to make. And uh, one of the questions I did or ask or say is, how can we encourage others to talk about um, digital inclusion and respect for human rights if they don't even understand what it's all about? Um, and again, I do think that all of these different multi-stakeholders should cooperate with one another because they are all interconnected and their responsibility is to educate one another and they each have a vital role to, again, allow people to speak out and to support people like us who are advancing in this kind of initiative. And again, like I did also mention a while ago that uh, being in hybrid mode is really awesome, especially here in forums, especially as for IGF, because people like me who are not able to be there are able to express um, my perspective on my country and you're able to see what's like here in the Philippines. And again, it's a game changer and we get to listen and educate each other about it. So yeah. Thank you, Bea. 
And so I would also like to add a few points from other speakers or attendees I mentioned in our breakout group discussion also. So in Chu from Taiwan mentioned that uh, transparency is really important because you know it shows like what's the model they're using in terms of the app and then the intention of the use of the data. And that's really important because we are giving out so many information these days, especially some some countries like we mostly use those QR code and then we give out the duration we stay in one place and then our personal data also. Um, and so uh, Elliot also mentioned about the point which is excellent about data minimizations, um, uh, meaning how we should minimize data we collected and at the same time maximizing uh, the public health benefit at the same time, which is something the Apple Google model is doing. And, and, you know, in terms of values and norms that we, when we are using such policies and develop the use of such technology, we really have to find a balance, especially, um, you know, when government um, are considering the use of such a technology, they also have to take in considerations that some people might not have access to device or internet. And I guess that's something we have to consider, especially that's a have a responsibility on government also, as in encouraging digital inclusion when we are trying to um, solve such big crisis these days. And I guess there are different two two main approach of different governments they say, where some believe in case-free and some believe in with, living with the virus. And so I guess they have to find a balance in terms of how much they are using this kind of uh, heavily, uh, I mean, data collecting uh, technology these days. I don't want to take up too much time because I will get to pass the time to group one to do some sharing on what you've been discussed. And so we can all, talk a little bit further later. Uh, thank you very much. And because we don't have much time, I think that maybe we can combine this part. And if you, Pratek, just could uh, quickly sum up the discussion and also add your closing remarks to that part. It, it's never a Zoom call until someone does that. Uh, had to be me. Anyway, uh, so yes, yeah, so as I said, we, we were in a short time, but I think you know the general... Uh, and, and I'll group the, you know, the, the four questions together, right? But uh, essentially, I think the, the views were that, look, uh, you know, businesses need to be more transparent about uh, their involvement uh, in, 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 uh, in developing things. Uh, governments have to be the ones that respect human rights, uh, right? I think of Fayo made this interesting point. Uh, Marie brought up the point about... Uh, you know, at, at especially at certain times, businesses should not be putting uh, profits over people, uh, and they need to think uh, think beyond profits. Uh, and you know, also gave the example of, uh, of of Facebook files. But in general, I think that you know the consensus was that uh, we needed to you know we, we need to have uh, these sort of processes need to be consult consultative. You need to bring different stakeholders together. You need to not just do it within countries. You need to do it in in you know in 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 regional. Uh, settings as well, uh, bring together civil society, bring together academia, bring together businesses, uh, and you know, as and, and as as Fire highlighted, we, there needs to be uh, transparency, responsibility, and accountability uh, all all through, right? And, and I think that uh, that mainly sums up. Uh, and, and think what 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 I would add was that we also need to to ensure that you know through these processes we're keeping uh, inclusivity in mind, we're keeping equity in mind, uh, we're making sure that uh, you know the vulnerable parts of the population are also accounted for and taken care of, uh, and this goes back to the you know the, the Ada Lovelace report that I had in my in my slides as well. Uh, that we need to account for errors and where, where things can go wrong so that we can protect the people who are affected by it. And I'll, I'll close with that. Thank you very much, Pratik, for your points and for uh, the closing remarks. And uh, I don't know, Jenna, shall I move to our next guest speaker and their remarks? Definitely. And if anyone who attending this meeting has any comments or questions, feel free to drop it in the chat also. 
and we'll try try our best to to address it before we end this meeting i guess yeah definitely so uh elliot uh, it's your turn for your closing point sure thank you yes i i think um the one big, big benefit i've gotten out of this is, is really broadening my view of um you know what what the contact tracing apps look like and, and the sorts of issues like i, I feel like I, I came into it going like oh you know it's <clears throat> It's just privacy. It's just a collection of data and the things around that. But now I'm wondering, oh, you know, what's sort of the off ramp? You know, how do we end the collection of data here? Um, you know, are there issues around the design um, and particularly around, you know, in developing uh, emerging economies? You know, how, how do we engage all the people without smartphones and everything? So I think certainly, I think the takeaway here is that the issue is um, very large, and the and maybe the point that I would end on is that. This is all incredibly new as well. Um, you know, 18 months ago, the idea of the contact tracing apps and all these sorts of technologies being used in this way was incredibly novel. Um, so you know, if we've seen these advancements in the last 18, 20 months, um, I'll be really excited to see what happens in the next um, period. Thank you very much, Elliot. And Janaina, the floor is now yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think it was quite a rich conversation, uh, um, very useful inputs from the speakers and also for the participants. And uh, as my final comments, uh, I would say that, um, as I said before, maybe you're shifting this conversation to vaccine passports and you should consider uh, these privacy issues and also thinking uh, once the, the government uh, and private companies have the taste of so much power, uh, some digital identification system where you have to have a QR code or you can uh, track uh, where you're going all the time. Uh, we, we are using this uh, as, uh, let's say, eight months uh, and how long more? Um, and actually we know that historically, it's really hard to give up uh, these newly acquired powers from private companies sorry, private companies and governments. So I think, yeah, we should continue to be aware and asking those questions all the time. Yeah, thank you very much for those inputs. Uh, so as we are heading to the end of the workshop, I just would like to ask the reporter of our session to do a quick sum up of the main points that were discussed today. Okay, sure. Um, let me just get to the beginning here. I think that a good way to sum everything up in a few minutes is the importance of a few principles that should be highlighted every time we're talking about these apps. And they are uh, responsibility, transparency, accountability, and inclusivity uh, and trust. Because uh, based, since we can have, uh, we cannot have hard answers to how to achieve a uh, good balance uh, on how these apps can get to, pre uh, pre to prevent the health issues related to COVID-19 and also data privacy issues, you need to get uh, to start on those principles to build solutions that are adequate to each place, to each country, each region. So I think that may sum most of the discussion, of course, I <laughs> can't sum all that was talked about in just a few minutes, but I believe this is uh, enough. Thank you very much, Pedro. And Jenna, do you have any final remarks from your side? I don't have much, but I would just like to say thank you to our on-site moderators and also um, our repertoire in making such um, 
our session happened. I'm so sorry about the notification, but I'm sure uh, we will publish a report with our detailed uh, information and discussion point that we made because I know Petro was doing a great work on our document and I can see all the points that, you know, all the discussions that were going on in the breakout room and also the sharing from our, our speakers uh, you know, captured here, and we're definitely uh, not missing anyone's point in a report. And so, everyone in this community or other, you know, stakeholders group can know what's happening in this room today. That we spend one and a half hour discussing this topic. And so, I guess that's 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 it from me. And I would like to thank our on-site participant and online participant for joining our session also. And I guess also a special thanks to one of our speaker, Elliot from Australia. It's really late hour right now, but thank you so much for staying up. Um, I guess it's over midnight now, but thank you so much for sharing such an amazing point with our panel today. And I hope that uh, you guys enjoy the session also. Back to you, Amelia. Thank you very much. We have eight seconds, so I will make it quick. Thank you very much, Jenna, for organizing this session. And thank you to all our speakers and attendees.